everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, March 5th, 2023. I predict that Phyllis will help Jeremy frame Diane for his murder. Maybe at Jack and Diane's wedding. <laughs> what do you think of that? What do you think of that? First of all, of course Jack asked Diane to marry him. Of course he did. They've been together for like three weeks. They've been living together for two weeks. It's about time they got married. <laughs> I'm sure Jack couldn't wait another second, and I'm sure it will be a short engagement, too. Probably a wedding to kick off our 50th season of The Young and the Restless. Kicking off the 50th season of The Young and the Restless with a wedding and a murder. <laughs> I love it. Or an apparent murder, maybe. Because Diane said this week that she wishes that Jeremy was dead. And Phyllis said this week that she wishes that Diane was dead. It's inevitable. Somebody's gonna die. <laughs> or pretend to die. But I think Phyllis and Jeremy are gonna come up with the plan to frame Diane for his murder. He's gonna make it look like he's dead. Everybody's gonna think she did it. Chances are already suspicious of them. And Phyllis is gonna help him right along. Phyllis helping Jeremy to frame frame Diane for his murder. That would be a villainous move on both of their parts. Jeremy would need someone like Phyllis to help him pull this off. I mean, he, he, she's, he, if he were to get caught, if any of the plan were to unravel, Phyllis would be the one to take the fall for it. Phyllis has made herself a villain at this point. Phyllis could have walked away from any of this at any point. But like she said this week when she was arguing with Summer, she is someone who fights for what she believes in and that is never going to change. I actually thought that it had changed a couple of decades ago, but the Phyllis that I was seeing on Friday really reminded me of the Phyllis that I first met, that we first met back in the 90s. I mean, the Phyllis who was absolutely off the rails on a crazy train. No apologies, just pure, unadulterated chaos. I'm impressed. <laughs> I have to say, I'm impressed and I'm intrigued. There is no villain like a vintage villain. And Phyllis is capable of some Sheila Carter level villainry here. I mean, heck, Sheila once had surgery to look like Phyllis. So I, this is working a lot for me. I've been saying I needed a villain and Phyllis absolutely can pull it off. I'm completely into this. Michelle Stafford is amazing. She goes all in on every thing she does. Phyllis this week looked wrecked. She looked exhausted. She looked like she had hit rock bottom. Phyllis had a big blow up with Summer early in the week and it was great. It was a great argument. It was very intense. Summer took it all the way back to her childhood. She said, you know, Mom, I was always the kid waiting around for the parent to get it together. I have survived all of your craziness, all of your failed relationships and such, and now, honestly, I just have to protect myself from you. I can't afford to get hurt by you anymore. Wow. I thought that was, that was a, a great summary of Summer's whole perspective, not just of the last couple of months, but of her entire life. And Phyllis seemed like she didn't know how to take it. She almost said too little in response. And that's when you know that Phyllis is really going to have it. Like when, she, when Phyllis chooses her words very carefully, 
<laughs> that's when you know that you're in trouble. And Phyllis just said, you know what? Maybe I'm the one that's done with you. That tells me she's got nothing left to lose. She has absolutely nothing left to lose. No further down to go. And then Michael and Lauren found her day drinking in the Grand Phoenix Hotel lobby. Absolutely sloshed in the lobby of this upscale hotel. I'm surprised that nobody called the cop. The cop because there's only one. <laughs> I'm surprised nobody called the cop to have Phyllis hauled out of there for disorderly conduct or something. Phyllis was loud and she was being belligerent and she completely snubbed her nose at the delicious filet mignon panini that Michael offered to her. I thought that sounded lovely and it was very rude of her to not take him up on it. <laughs> Michael said, here, why don't you have some? Soak up the booze. <laughs> that scene was one for the vaults, one for the for a future flashback, for sure. It, it just doesn't get any better than that. Michael and Lauren's reactions were comedic, but they also summed up everything that I feel about Phyllis with so much heart. It's, it's like, Phyllis, I love you, but you are not seeing this situation clearly. You have a huge blind spot where your ego is. It's like your ego creates a blind spot in your life and you're bringing all of this trouble onto yourself. It's not Summer. It's not Daniel. It's not Diane. It's you. Truth be told, you could have been the one who was relaxing and watching romantic movies at the Abbott Cabin with Jack this week, but you chose to be petty with Diane from the very beginning. And, and, and she won. Diane bested you. All Diane had to do was wait for Phyllis to implode and then collect the prize. A game, set, and match. And what a prize. Jack and Diane had Kyle throw a little subterfuge at Jeremy this week, telling him that they had left the country to go on a trip when really they just drove up to the Abbott cabin for some romance in the woods. <laughs> I thought that was great. I love the cabin. I had been saying that I wanted to see it again. And it was cozy. I just loved seeing Jack and Diane relaxing, watching a movie, talking, gazing out the window at the wildlife, playing coy with each other by the fireplace, and then scurrying off to the bedroom. What can I say? I'm a simple girl. That is my perfect idea of a mature soap opera romance right there. But now I have a different set of standards for a sizzling hot soap opera affair. <laughs> That's a completely different story. I have higher expectations for sizzling hot soap opera affair. <laughs> I just love going to the office every day to make out with Nate. <laughs> it is such a nice little perk of my job. <laughs> oh, I make out with him in his office, and then I make out with him in my office. There are so many places to make out. <laughs> This is going so well for me. <laughs> well, early in the week, Nate and Victoria started making out in her office with absolutely no buildup, absolutely like no indication that a makeout sesh was about to happen. They were not having sexy talk. They were not having sexy eyes. They just went right from business talk into smooches in the blink of an eye. There was no time to even think about it. But then again, what is there to think about? Elena? Nah. <laughs> we can think about Elena later when the guilt sets in. And it did. Because the next time makeout time came, <laughs> 
check my wallet. Oh, it's makeout time. Next time that happened, um, Nate was tempted, of course, but he decided instead to use his lips to talk to Victoria about what was going on between them. I was like, wait, what? Talk? That's annoying. <laughs> but I thought that Victoria handled it very well. She's aware that she is single, and I think she called herself unencumbered. <laughs> single and unencumbered. But Nate is not. She knows this. She knows that she can, she's free to do anyone she wants, but he is not. Um, she just doesn't care about that though. I mean, she says, I know what I want and I'm in for what I want. The rest is up to you. It's your decision. And I appreciated what Nate had to say. He told Victoria that she's very attractive. Um, he was very complimentary toward her. I mean, he let her know in no uncertain terms that there's a burning passion in him for her, but he is in love with Elena. And I thought it was very interesting that Nate said that he and Elena are in a good place because it seems to me that Nate and Elena are always fighting. It was maybe only two weeks ago that she walked out on him because he had broken another one of his promises to take her on a romantic vacation. And if it's not a romantic vacation that he's breaking, it's a romantic dinner. He's always breaking some kind of promise to her. And I think Nate is just oblivious to the fact that they are not in a good place. He, he just must not be able to see it clearly because he's mostly happy. He's mostly happy, so that means everything's fine. But that doesn't mean everything's fine, and it doesn't mean that Elena is happy. And now, Elena has got a reason to be suspicious because Audra tipped her off. I was surprised, but also completely thrilled by the fact that Elena just, just sitting there like a little angel received this devilish message from Audra. Audra just boldly told Elena how much time Victoria and Nate are spending together and Audra implied that it was kind of unnecessary. I mean, it was very easy to read between the lines, Elena. He is cheating on you. Elena is going to walk in on them one of these days, and they're going to deserve it, too, because they're not really even being all that careful. Because early, early in the week, Audra uh, knocked at the door while Nate and Victoria were in the middle of a makeout session, and they both just said, oh, come in. But then when Audra walked in, Nate was still wiping his lips, and Victoria was still fixing her hair. It was like, it was so obvious but they're just standing there like, oh, no, nothing scandalous is going on here. Victor and Victoria still have their sights set on acquiring Tucker McCall's company. For Victoria, I think it's just a play thing. I think that Victoria wants to make McCall Unlimited her newest toy, and I think she wants to see if she has the power to make it happen. And she's not afraid of reminding Nate that she's the one who has more power. She's happy to share it when he complies, but at the end of the day, she's the one who calls the shots. And Victoria told Nate that now she sees it as his job to convince Devon that it would not be a good idea to buy McCall Unlimited, um, which of course, if Nate tells Devon not to buy it, that's only gonna make Devon want to buy it more. In the previews we saw Victoria also sniffing around, so I mean, of course Devon's gonna buy it. <laughs> But Victor also has his eye on McCall, and it's part of a different power play. I mean, it's, it's just all power play. For Victor, he, he actually told Adam this week that he wants to buy McCall to let Adam run it 
separately as a separate entity apart from Newman Enterprises um, so that he wouldn't be under Victoria or interacting with Victoria on a daily basis. Um, it would just be something that Adam could have all on his own. And Victor decided this week that the only thing he has to do in order to get what he wants is find out who it was that bought Tucker's debt and why they might want to help him. Well, that's where Nikki came in. <laughs> Nikki, in her fabulous sparkly skirt, told Victor that Ashley and Tucker had started up a little something and Nikki correctly tipped Victor off that Ashley was the one who was behind it. So Victor and Victoria called Ashley over to Newman Enterprises to interrogate her about it. And I thought that was a very good scene, aside from the fact that Eileen Davidson just looked excellent there with her hair and her jumpsuit. I mean, it's really been years I think since we've seen Ashley at Newman Enterprises, so there was just something very satisfying about seeing her on that set. Victor was in his chair, he was in the chair, and Victoria was standing beside him, and Ashley was lying through her teeth right in front of them, saying, no, no, I'm not the one who bought Tucker's debt. Maybe you should ask Devon. I thought that was surprising that Ashley would point the finger at Devon. Maybe she was just being hopeful that that's how it would work out. Um, Ashley had uh, talked to Abby this week, and Abby told Ashley about Devon's troubles on the Winter family side, and so Ashley kind of went for bat, went to bat for the McCall family side. It was clear to Abby and to the audience that Ashley was willing to let in a little bit of forgiveness when it comes to Tucker and so Abby did a turnaround and started doing the same. She was able to soften Devon up a little bit when Tucker took Ashley's advice and offered to sell his company not to Victoria and Victor but to Devon instead. Of course I guess saying that Ashley advised it is not exactly correct. That's kind of an understatement because Ashley pretty much demanded that that's what Tucker should do. I think that Ashley sees this as a way of helping Tucker become the man that he says he wants to be and reuniting Tucker with his son would be an important part of that. But at the same time, Ashley is also testing Tucker. She has her sights set on, on him in more than one way. But she told Tucker that Victor and Victoria would be willing to buy his company for a boatload of money and that would make him a very rich man once again. And it was a little bit of a test. And Tucker stuck to his word. He says that he is divesting himself of the company for good. He does not need to make a boatload of money. He just wants to be a better person. He just wants to have a good relationship with his son. And also, he wants to have a balanced relationship with Ashley. I really liked how Tucker pushed back on Ashley when she tried to get sexy with him, almost demanding, like she spent the whole week demanding that he, uh, demanding of what he would do with his company, and then she had a moment where she was kind of demanding what he might do with his body. <laughs> and Tucker pushed back and he said, no, the power dynamic is not equal between us, and so I don't think that's right. So as much as I want this, I'm not going to move forward with, with the sexy part. And Ashley didn't like hearing that, but yet I think it was exactly what she wanted to hear. I'm, I'm liking this dynamic. I'm liking that a lot. Well, Devon agreed to meet with Tucker, and Tucker pleaded his case for why Devon should buy his company. I mean, Tucker was mostly just stroking Devon's ego, which is all you really have to do. Tucker told Devon that, well, you'd be able to run my company responsibly and ethically, and um, I'm sure you'd be able to take it to a level that I never could. Plus, I'll give you the friends and family discount. <laughs> I liked that. Tucker's life is on fire sale. <laughs> 
<laughs> Ashley and Devon got the friends and family discount on, on Tucker's Life. I liked that. I thought that was a, a little clever wordplay there. Oh, Abby has been there supporting Devon every step of the way, encouraging him um, when it comes to the McCall side of the family and also when it comes to the winner's side of the family. And I just have to take a moment to say, I really think that Abby and Devon are hot. I like them together. I think they are very steamy in the bedroom. Melissa Ordway just kills any and all of her sex scenes. She is just sex A. And I found their sex scenes to be very steamy. Um, but it also feels very effortless between them when they're just having conversation. I think she's good for him and... <laughs> It's really going to tick Amanda off to see that. <laughs> That's going to be pleasurable to watch. Or maybe it won't tick Amanda off at all, seeing how happy Abby and Devon are together. Maybe it will feel very validating to Amanda to know that she made the right decision to, by leaving him. One connection that I can't believe I forgot to make... Uh, when I heard that Mamie was going to be coming back for the 50th anniversary season, I immediately connected her to the Abbott family. Of course, she worked for the Abbott family for years and years, but duh, Allie. Mamie is Drusilla's aunt, so surely when Mamie does come back, she's going to be connecting with Lily and Devon and certainly weighing in on the conflict between them. I mean, we have a lot of talk every week about Neil and what Neil would want and what Neil would think of Lily and Devon. But what about Drusilla? I wonder if Mamie will say something that will make Lily and or Devon back down. I mean, do you guys think that Lily and Devon will ever make it to court? Do you think that we will get a courtroom scene? In fact, I want to ask you that question as a poll, as a prediction poll. Do you think that we will see the inside of a courtroom in 2023? If you want to cast your prediction vote on that, go to yrchat.com. When was the last time we even saw the inside of a courtroom on YNR? Are those days over? Can anyone even remember the last time? Will YNR go to the trouble of building up a new, a new courtroom set? Maybe we'll get two courtroom scenes this year. One for Lily and Devon's business battle, and one for Diane being on trial for Jeremy's murder. <laughs> that could be entertaining. It's been a while since we've had any courtroom drama. I think I can handle it. I'm kind of thinking that would be something to look forward to. I'm almost afraid to get my hopes up, though. Ugh, the feud between Lily and Devon has really been cranked up. It is very heated between them. And no doubt, Crystal Khalil and Brighton James are nailing those scenes. The dialogue is so intense. It seems like they're, they're both kind of saying, Neil would be ashamed of you. No, Neil would be ashamed of you. And it's, it's, that's, it's gotten pretty low down and dirty. It's gotten pretty personal. I feel like we've heard a lot from Devon and his side of the story. But I thought it was very interesting this week that we heard from Lily. She was telling Daniel that she feels like she really doesn't have anything else besides work right now. Her relationship with Billy is over her kids are grown. Her parents are gone. This is it for her. Chancellor Winters is her whole life. It's all she has. And Daniel very sweetly said, well, hey, what about your friends? <laughs> but of course, it's friends who used to be exes. I mean, Daniel and Lily almost kissed this week. Almost. And then, like true teenagers, they both acted so appalled by it. Oh, no, I can't believe I almost kissed my sexy ex. 
<laughs> my sexy ex who's always there for me. What will I do? <laughs> um, well, things at Chancellor Winters and at Omega Sphere seem to be rolling along despite the lawsuit. Daniel was so enthusiastic about Chelsea's game idea this week. <laughs> and I felt kind of bad for him because Chelsea walked up to them and she explained all about her suicidal depression first, like before she gave him the game idea. And so then after she gave the game idea, he kind of had to say yes. <laughs> He either had to say yes, or he had to pretend to go to the bathroom and then, like, jump out the window or something to get away. Because saying no is not an option after someone tells you that they were standing on a rooftop thinking about ending their life just a couple of months ago. Why does Adam always have to show up at Sally's hotel room, withering and drunk. I don't understand why Adam is being written like such a loser. And I don't know even when that happened because it's not new. He's been this withering drunk loser ever since he and Sally broke up. What happened? It's, it's not as if the Adam Newman that I know doesn't have the nerve to deal with all of this head on. He's Adam Newman, son of Victor Newman. He has been shot, blown up, cut up. He can handle being a dad. <laughs> and this isn't even the first time he's ever been in love. I, I mean, I, I get it. He loves Sally a lot. He's heartbroken, but he shouldn't be quaking in his boots every time he knocks on her hotel room door. Why is he being such a weenie when it comes to her? Maybe playing hard to get would go a long way. Show her what she's missing. Show her that sexy, cool, above it all attitude that he's known for, that we all like about him. Like, where did that go? Where'd that guy go? I don't know. Frankly, Nick was looking extra good to me after the drunk hotel show up. Nick was standing there in the background looking all shirtless and buff and dumb. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> fine. I'd rather have Nick shirtless and buff and dumb than Adam sobbing at my door like a nervous teenager. Ugh. Ugh. Adam asked Allie to, er, Allie, Sally to go downstairs to the lobby to be apart from Nick so that they could talk about the baby. But all he said, he, I mean, Adam just basically said, okay, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything you say. I'm going to be a good dad. And I, I'm, there's no getting back together. No, no, I'm just going to be a dad. I'm, I'm going to go to your, I will also want to go to your doctor's appointments. I'm going to do all that perfectly. Anything you say, Sally, anything you say. And she actually said to him, by the way, she said, wow, this is the most mature I've seen you be. I'm sorry, but that is condescending. He is a 40 year old man with a Harvard degree, with like two divorces and a preteen. Why is he so immature? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Why, why did the writers struggle so hard to get this character right? I don't know. It's like he's either got no emotions and I can't connect to him or he's just this melted mass of puddle of teenage love <laughs> at age 40. I mean, seriously, Nick better hope that Adam does not get it back together and start being the man that he was last year for the little sliver of time that they actually got him right and he was a, a, a nuanced human. 
when, a rat, when Sally originally fell for him. It was smart of Nick to video call <laughs> Sally after that meeting because the last time that Sally and Adam were alone together, they decided to make it one more for the road. And that's what got them into this mess. So, yeah, I see, I see what you did there, Nick, and it was smart. I see, okay, I, I'm kind of feeling like this story has gone right back to the same irritating cycle that we were in before the paternity test results bubble got popped. I mean, it was interesting for the last, for the, there was a couple weeks in there where it was like, okay, well, who's going to be the dad, even though we all knew who it was going to be, and it was sort of exciting, but now we're just right back to the triangle I don't know if I can stand nine more months of this. And I honestly don't think I'll have to. I really think that Sally is going to miss Carrie. Like with her headaches and her high blood pressure, I really think she's going to miss Carrie. I mean, what, what else is Lionar going to do? Have her bring the baby home to her hotel room? In other baby-related news. So... Mariah and Tessa have become the proud parents of a beautiful baby girl off screen. Wow. <laughs> the commitment level to Mariah and Tessa's story is low. <laughs> it is real low. If Mariah just stopped by the coffee house to tell Sharon about it, no Tessa, no baby, no drama, just a report, just everybody else looking at baby pictures on Mariah's phone that I can't see. I don't want to see characters looking at pictures of the baby. That doesn't connect me to the story. I mean, I can understand if Mariah and Tessa are taking shifts. So Tessa's with the baby, Mariah's making the rounds, giving everybody the update, and it's just an adjustment period. But I'm telling you, I'm giving this one week. If I don't see a baby, or at least Tessa, by next week, I'm calling in a search party. Care and caution can prevent a crash and burn. Who said that last week? Well... The answer is Billy. Billy was talking to Chelsea about the advice that Jack had given him, and he seemed to be saying all of the right things. Care and caution can prevent a crash and burn. Well, that was a pretty good one. I, I think it was pretty hard, but Henry, Daisy, Ron, David D, Kenzie, Tina B, good old Marky, Sue W, and Sharita, you guys all guessed that it was Billy. Here's another quote for you. I love this quote. I agree with it completely. We're all more alike than we are different. Don't you just love that? We're all more alike than we are different. I think that's a great line, and if everybody thought that way, there'd be no drama. <laughs> So don't everybody get it in your head that we're going to have peace, love, and harmony or anything. There'd be no drama. <laughs> but if you do so happen to know who said we're all more alike than we are different, then you should go to yrchat.com to leave your guess. And if you get it right, I will give you your shout out during next week's YNR Chat. And let me kick off our comments section here by saying a very special birthday shout out to Erin. Erin on YouTube! You're like one of the original YNR chatters. I love you so much. I have, hope you have a beautiful birthday on March 8th. Leave me a comment this week and let me know how your birthday's going or if you have any plans and boy I will be thinking of you. Um, Diana, uh, on birthdays and baby notes, Diana says, Allie, I think YNR wants you to do a poll on what Mariah and Tessa's baby name should be. The fact that they haven't named the baby yet tells me that they want to get ideas from the viewers. It might be fun also to hear what names the chatters suggest. Having said that, I think the name, Aria, 
would be suitable. It's pretty sounding, but more importantly, it's meaning. The definition of aria is a long accompanied song for a solo voice, typically one in opera or oratorio. Tessa is a singer, so this name may be a good choice. Aria, that is beautiful. I can't believe you thought of that. And this is such a positive comment. Thank you, Diana, for this too, because I guess if YNR's not really celebrating Mariah and Tessa and the baby on screen, maybe we need to do that off screen instead. So that's a, a lovely idea to, sp to spin this around. What do you guys think Mariah and Tessa's baby name should be? Laura has a prediction saying she thinks the new baby will be named Luna. Well, I think that's a beautiful name too. So many beautiful creative names for little girls these days. What do you think Mariah and Tessa should name the baby? Leave me a comment this week and let me know. Um, in other baby news, Laura says, not a vitamin person. Sally, this pregnancy isn't about you, sweetheart. I wish Uncle Daddy Nick would have said folic acid reduces the risk of spina bifida. <laughs> oh my, I know, she said, Nick's like, she's like, I have headaches, I don't feel good, high blood pressure. Well, have you been taking your prenatal vitamin? Not really a vitamin burns in. <laughs> she's gonna miscarry. Sorry, sad but true. And then what was the other thing she wasn't doing? She ate cashews out of the, she ate salt cashews out of the mini bar. No, girl, no. You are not taking this pregnancy seriously. Tina says, Nick is definitely seeing that this baby will be bringing Sally and Adam closer together. He knew deep down Sally's feelings for Adam. I hope in the near future that Nick isn't the cause of Sally losing the baby out of his jealousy. Hmm. Oh. Well, Sue W says that would be a nasty turn of events. Gosh, I hope Sally doesn't lose the baby for any reason. I don't care one whit about fake people getting their romances stomped on, but any baby-related heartbreak, soap fake or otherwise, gets me emotionally every time. No. I know, I don't want to, you know, I just feel like that's where it's headed. It's got, it would be sad. I feel like that's the thing that's going to bring Adam and Sally back together, though. I think they're going to, it's going to be a little chilly over the next couple of weeks through um, for Adam and Sally and trying to navigate this new world. And yeah, we're going to see Nick being a little jealous here and there. Then I think she's going to lose the baby and Adam and Sally are going to look up at each other and realize that they wanted it and they wanted it together and that'll get them back together and give Nick the boot. He can go back to Sharon. <laughs> That's what I think. Well, Sue W. also says, I think that Josh Morrow and Courtney Hope have extraordinary chemistry in that they are perfectly selling Nick and Sally's relationship as the awkwardly different aged, not in love, but truly caring for each other and having great sex involvement that it is. I've not thought that they or the writers have ever tried to present it as otherwise. Josh Morrow and Courtney Hope's portrayals would have been very different if designed and written as passionately in love soulmates. To me, successful chemistry between actors is how well they play off each other to believably sell their characters' interactions in the dynamic that's given them to play. I think Josh Morrow and Courtney Hope together are nailing their characters and situations perfectly as their characters nail each other lol <laughs> they're nailing it perfectly as nailing each other yes you know that is the best point that i've seen on on the whole situation yes they're not written to be the starstruck star-crossed hopelessly in love passionately in love soulmate lovers that is the writing that's Adam and and Sally, but we can't, you know, it's not it's not the Nick and Sally's chemistry. It doesn't mean that there's a lack of chemistry between Nick and Sally. It's that they're not being written that way. That's not what it is. Nick is the in the meantime good sex, um, stable thing that Sally is choosing right now. That's a great point. Wow. Um, and I really just I think that the the fantasy episode that we got last week says a lot about Sally's choice and the the pros and cons of life to both of them. And at the end of the day, she still picked Nick. But I asked 
you guys last week how you feel about those dream sequences and fantasy episodes. I'm surprised that 66% of you, the majority of you, don't like them. You don't like dream sequences and fantasy episodes. Um... I, I voted yes with the minority. 33% said they do like them. I think they're a, a, a good way to give you a little slice of alternate story. You don't have to go in too deep on anything. It just gives you a little nugget. Um, Michelle also vo voted yes, saying, I like dream sequences and fantasy episodes when they make it obvious in the lighting like this one. Don't trick us. We got to see both sides of the possibilities. We got to see both sides of the possibilities with Sally, and I found that to be juicy. That's a really key point. So you like the fantasy as long as it's clear that it's a fantasy and you don't like it when it really seems like it's going that way and then it's a trick. I think that's a very fair point. Mary Ann V says, I like the fantasy episodes if they make sense. I voted yes for this one. It was done well and I didn't even realize it was a fantasy at first, but it makes sense because Sally really has a reason to be with either brother. Since Adam is the father, more drama. Adam loves her, and she should be with him and their baby. I don't think Nick loves her. She has more chemistry with Adam anyway. Sue W votes yes for the for the fantasy dream sequences and fantasies when from when it's from an awake character's thoughts or imagination running amok. It's fun to see a character's perspective of others, which often gives those actors a chance to play traits and reactions they otherwise would not. I'm not a fan of some ridiculous nightmare a character wakes up from. Um, I don't know what what Freud said. Those don't necessarily represent one's innermost thoughts. At least mine never have. Thank goodness. Oh, that's a good point, too, that it gives the characters a chance to do something that they wouldn't otherwise get and it gets the it gives the viewers a chance to experience something that we wouldn't otherwise experience i voted yes for the fantasies sharita says though if y and r must if what if y and r if you must do a dream sequence let it be a victoria rowell as Drusilla telling her children and nephew to stop the nonsense, letting them know that this is not what Neil would want. Sharita, can you even imagine? They let her come back for the Neil tribute episode. Um, there's just so must be so much bad blood there or something. But I mean. Uh, that would be great. I mean, just a quick little flashback or fantasy with Victoria Rowell as Drusilla coming to talk some sense into Lily and Devon. Ugh, so good. And, you know, there is all of this talk about what Neil would want. How about this point from Ellen, who says, Devon has zero regard for his grandmother, the woman who made him a billionaire, Catherine poured herself into running Chancellor Industries. Why doesn't that mean anything at all to the selfish brat, Devon? It's Neil and the winter's name only. I know Neil died unexpectedly and young and they work together, but the merged company carries both names, Chancellor and Winters, two names that should be very meaningful to Devon. Why can't he throw himself into caring about the merged company? Yeah, I mean, the only answer there, of course, is the drama. But yes, you, you make a great point from his character perspective. He should care about the Chancellor name at least as much as he cares about the Winter's name. But Sherrod says, Devon wants complete control. He proved that already. He doesn't like to share. Yeah, that, that explains Devon's motives, perhaps. He just wants complete control. Victoria says, yikes, Devon and Lily are taken off the gloves. I can't believe how pointed and mean they are to each other. Fortunately, Lily got in more burns. I agree, Devon signed a contract. Ellen pointed out that he forgets he's a chancellor, which is part of his heritage. Devon should accept the money and go on to develop a company with only the Winter's name, if that's how he feels. There may be no going back for these two many years. It's very personal now. Yeah, you know, I, it, the contract is what puts me on to Lily and Jill's side. It, to me, it's all about the contract. You signed the contract, you gave it away. There's no going back. You can't then turn around and, and say sour grapes. You signed it. You signed it. 
that's just to me that it is a little bit black and white there. But Ellen says, I'm glad that Lily has Daniel at this moment in her life. They have such a long history together. They were basically children when they ran away together. Lily and Daniel each need someone who feels like family, and they can fill that role for each other. Maybe they won't be a super couple, but I like the sense of history they share. Lily's loneliness tugs at my heart sometimes. Yeah, I felt her loneliness too this week, and I am also glad that Daniel is there for her. And what a great point that they were basically children when they ran away together. They, you know, I mean, the marriage has been over for a long time, and I'm sure they've both evolved and matured so much since then. I think it's great to see them um, supporting each other now, and I'm all for a, a relationship. I don't, I mean, like you, I don't know if it'll turn into a super couple, but I certainly like, I like them together. Oh, well, here's Daisy weighing in for Team Devon. Daisy says, I would think that the contract Devon signed is null and void because Jill wants to change the company from family run to public. And I don't see how Lily bringing up Devon's personal life will help her win the case. If she and Jill go down the personal route, they're fair game. And Devon can start with Lily killing the woman he loved. Good luck with that, Jill. Oh, yeah, you know, that you think the contract is null and void because the changes to the company happened at, right after the contract was uh, signed. I guess it would all just depend on the legal ease, but, but well, I imagine we'll figure that out once we get to court. If we get to court, I can't believe I'm saying it, but I, I think a trial would be a really great thing for the 50th season. I'm all for spending a couple weeks in court. Daisy also says, though, I thought that even if Tucker were to buy comp Tucker's, uh, sorry, I thought that even if Devon buys Tucker's company, he'll still want to buy his company back. It would make no sense for him to just step away from the company he built with Neil. So I hope he does both. And then he and Tucker can work toward buying Catherine's company, which I hope happens at some point. Yeah, I think chan the Chancellor Company maybe needs to be in the hands of a Chancellor. Um, Jill's on the show so little that uh, maybe you're right. Maybe Devon will buy Tucker's company and he'll continue with the lawsuit. And maybe Devon and Tucker together will take over Chancellor Winters at some point. <laughs> Tina Cole says, Victoria, it is not flex to score a cheater, even if it is Nate. She hated it when Billy cheated on her, and now she has no problem having Nate cheat on Elena. I would love to see Elena claw into Victoria, and after Nate gets with Victoria, then Audra can swoop in and make Victoria feel some completion. <laughs> <laughs> that is good. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to see Elena's claws come out. There's, the, Elena and Victoria on the surface seem like they'd be no match because Victoria seems like she's got all the power. But I really think Elena's great. I think she's got power. She's, she's, she's just, there's something about her that I continuously like. And I want to see more sides of her. Well, Victoria says, Audra you sly one. Planting the seeds of doubt in Elena's mind and pointing her to Victoria. Can't wait to see if the seeds take root. I mean, they have to, right? Diana says, Audra is so condescending and disingenuous when she speaks to Elena. I admit it was fun to watch, even though I hate to see Elena being treated this way. Audra treats Elena exactly the same way that Imani did. It appears that Elena has to go through these super silliest conversations if she wants to be with Nate. It's worth it. Elena must be convinced that all the women in Genoa City are unfriendly cows who want her man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's true, isn't it? <laughs> All the women in Genoa City and outside of Genoa City want Nate. It's got to be hard to hang on to him. Sherrod says, I loved everything about what Audra was doing. You say sly, I say slithery. She oozes sexy. Yeah, just within the past couple of weeks, Audra has really bumped up, like, bo she's gotten so many bonus points for me for, for just kind of stepping in on Nate and Victoria and not taking no for an answer when Nate denied something was going on, and then this week, giving Elena the heads up, which I didn't take exactly as 
her trying to hurt Elena. I took it as, hey, something's going on and you should know about it. I, I kind of took it not as a negative thing. I was glad she gave Elena a little bit of the heads up. Um, there was something about that that actually made me like Audra more. Well, new topic. Gary says, Phyllis Summers, you are D-R-U-N-K. I gave birth to you in an elevator. Call me back. <laughs> Those drunk calls were something else. I gave birth to you in an elevator. And she grabs her chest. An elevator. Call me back. <laughs> Oh, Naomi says, Phyllis is breaking my heart. I understand her frustration and certainly identify with getting ugly when people pat you on the head and say, now, now, we mustn't be ugly when you really want them to join in your fury at the world in general. When people hurt Phyllis, she immediately wants to hurt right back. I am afraid for her and for those in her path. She will tell Jeremy Stark about the cabin and probably drive him there. Ooh, Kamna says, someone predicted Diane's murder at the beginning of the year, and now I'm thinking that was an excellent prediction. Although I'd prefer a murder attempt that leads to Diane not pressing charges against Phyllis, given the impact on Summer, that would drive Phyllis off the deep end for sure. Yeah, I think it was Sherrod who predicted Diane would die, and maybe that'll be the case. But Kamna says, um, I kind of wish they'd just go with Phyllis having a drinking problem. It'd be great to see some solid dramatic acting from Michelle Stafford like we did with Melissa Claire Egan rather than the regular Phyllis narcissistic histrionics. Histronics. <laughs> Yeah, but you want you want to see something like her struggling with a drinking problem rather than the regular narcissism. Yeah, I like that. Uh, but Lara makes this great point about Phyllis. How about this? Lara says, "Well, I see Phyllis as kind of a supernatural being." Flaming hair, hot temper, furious strength, flawed, incredibly high strung, acerbic, yes, 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 evil things done to Christine, blah, blah, blah. But she's also the one who helped Jack overcome a drug addiction and who figured out that Adam had taken faith from Sharon, her nemesis, and she saved the day. I guess I appreciate her unique over-the-top reactions to situations. With Phyllis, it's all or nothing. There is no place in her brain for self-doubt. She never stops to reflect before taking action. That is not in her DNA. I judge her by a different standard because she's Phyllis. <laughs> <laughs> great, Lara, that's great. And Tina says, Michelle Stafford is amazing. Phyllis is falling apart, and Michelle is playing it to the hilt. Her blah to Michael just shows how all in Michelle is. I loved Michael's reactions. They play off each other so well that you hardly notice Lauren caught in the middle and totally appalled at Phyllis's behavior. What a great scene. Yes, it's it's also worth saying that, I mean, of course, Michelle Stafford, of course, was so amazing in those scenes. But Michael and Lauren also gave great reactions to Phyllis's actions. Well, and Gary says, Jack Abbott and Diane Jenkins, you cannot run away from your problems. And the sooner you realize that, the better off you're going to be. Uh, yeah, I think it's funny that Jack's whole solution to the problem was, let's get out of town. I'll save you from that fallen tree branch. No, let's get married. That'll solve our stalker problem. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know. What if all of this is leading up to a real death? Ah, what if it's all leading up to Diane's death? Where is Diane's headstone? I don't know if I can lose her twice. Okay, everybody. That's a wrap. That's a chat. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I hope you go to yrchat.com to leave your comments about it, leave your comments about the show, and vote in the poll. 
fingers crossed for a courtroom scene this year. 2023 is promising to have some some different stuff, a lot of stars, and maybe we'll get some new sets too. So hopefully Wano will get, peel away a little bit of budget to give us something different visually, as well as the returns from our classic characters. Plus, I've still got my eyes open for the new intro. I mean, I think, that, so the anniversary week is supposed to begin, what is it, the last week of March or something? So we don't have that much longer to go, and who knows, maybe we'll look up a couple of weeks from now and everything will be different. Well, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. I love you very much, and I will see you next Sunday. Bye, guys!